Hi, everybody, and welcome to our conference presentation on Liter Little Readers Big World, Fostering Literacy Motivation Amongst Diverse Elementary Students. My name is Celeste Ariano, and I teach fourth grade in Corpus Christi, Texas. Hello, my name is Jonathan Hake, and I teach fourth grade up in the Twin Cities. And hi, my name is Lindsay Baca, and I teach third grade in Detroit. My name is Liam Johnson and I teach third grade in Dallas, Texas. So two weeks ago, the Washington Post came out with a groundbreaking uh, discovery. They found that 63% of elementary school students love to read the dictionary. It was, it was an incredible piece of uh, journalism. You guys are smart people. You know that I just told a big lie. Elementary school students do not love to read the dictionary because they're not motivated to. In this presentation, we will explore strategies to motivate elementary school students to read. And a quick spoiler alert, um, telling students to read the dictionary and write down definitions is not one of those strategies. Right. So as Liam said, um, we have a big why in this presentation. So our research question for this conference paper and presentation was, what are the most effective strategies to promote literacy engagement, which we defined as intrinsic motivation among students of varying backgrounds? And our purpose in doing all of this was to increase the love of reading amongst all students and not have them sitting there reading boring dictionaries, as Liam described. So first we're gonna define a few terms for you guys that we're gonna use um, continuously throughout the presentation. The first is reading motivation. So generally motivation, the most common definition is an individual's goals, values, and beliefs in regards to processes and outcomes of a particular activity. So in this case, the activity is going to be reading and how a student finds motivation in doing so. In the classroom, students typically show one of two types of motivation. The first that they can show is extrinsic motivation. In extrinsic motivation, you may have heard this term in an undergrad psych class or in lots of different types of classes, but extrinsic motivation is when students find outward rewards. So they look for rewards, incentives, praise, and that drives them and motivates them to achieve their goals. So in this graphic, you can see that grades, punishment, praise, money, those are all factors that are found on the outside. They're not developed within. Intrinsic motivation, on the other hand, is doing something for its own sake. So that's doing something out of a sense of pride, interests, because you want to achieve inside or just being curious about it. So we can all, as teachers, predict that developing a sense of intrinsic motivation is definitely going to be the more challenging task. But it does pay off because research finds that high achieving students demonstrate higher intrinsic reading motivation than average readers. So it does seem that intrinsic reading motivation is linked to higher reading achievement. We're also gonna talk about reading engagement. So engagement deals with the behavioral, cognitive and emotional involvement within academic activities. So this is the degree to which your students are showing engagement in your reading lessons or just in reading in general. Highly engaged students in reading may exhibit behaviors like sustained attention in reading activities or expressing very positive emotions while discussing a book or providing thoughtful commentary in response to your questions. Those are just a few behaviors that we see amongst our highly engaged students. So our research is really going to center on this reading engagement model, showing that when students have high intrinsic reading motivation, that naturally leads to a higher sense of reading engagement. And with the combination of those two factors, we have higher reading achievement, which is our ultimate goal. So in this presentation, we're really going to target a sense of developing higher intrinsic motivation and higher engagement in order to get that higher achievement. our research, we decided to focus on four distinct um, diverse elementary groups. Now, diverse can be taken many different ways. So our first group we defined as low and high achieving students. Our second group is culturally diverse students. Our third group is students with trauma. And our fourth group is students with ADHD. 
All right, and I'll be going ahead and talking about our first diverse uh, population with our low and high achieving students. So students often get classified as high achievers or low achievers in the classroom in the domain of reading. Now it's important that we think about how reading achievement can be defined and Guthrie defines it as word recognition, fluency, comprehension strategies, and domain knowledge. Now, all of these processes are tied to reading comprehension and motivation does play an important role in this process because students need to be able to see the value, their beliefs, and their individual personal goals that encourage them to read. Now, research suggests that intrinsic motivation is more beneficial for long-term learning. So children with high intrinsic motivation tend to engage in reading activities more often and want to practice their reading skills. Hence, we can call them high achieving readers. Now, Guthrie and, and Wickfield found that when students perceive reading as hard and associate reading with negative assignments, their intrinsic motivation is low. Therefore, those students are classified as low achieving readers. Now, for this, reading motivation plays an important role when educators classify their students as high achievers or low achievers. So some strategies that can help with us approach our, our motivation is the first concept-oriented reading instruction. Now, this is designed to teach students reading comprehension through the integration of science and reading. CORI, for short, consists of using content goals in a concept, providing hands-on experiences, giving students the choice and decision-making abilities, and using a variety of interesting text, and providing a class discussion about the concept. So how this might look in a classroom is if you are teaching a science lesson that day, you might give your students a big concept. For example, their habitat. You would allow them to go ahead and like, make observations about their habitat, ranging from maybe the birds to the trees to the sky. And now you are tapping into what the students are interested in. When they come back to the classroom, you're gonna ask them to go ahead and think of a question. How does this apply to our habitat around you? So you're, ta you're tapping into their beliefs and you're also tapping into the way that they can research their information. So students might be able to look at an encyclopedia. Students might be able to look at a classroom library or they might go ahead and do a quick uh, Google search and then you can go ahead and teach them about different sources that you might use. Then they'll all gather their research and they'll present it in some sort of graphic or a way that they want to present their information. Some students might do a nice poster. Some students might actually want to write a paragraph, just depending on what they are interested in. And at the end, you'll share as an entire class to share all of this research that they had found. So really focusing on being able to tackle all the things that they value, being able to, for them to see themselves as readers and to discuss what they are reading. Now, a second strategy that can be used with our low and high, high achieving students is peer assisted learning strategies or for short PALS. PALS is a peer tutoring instructional program that supplements the primary reading curriculum. So basically what this means is students work together on reading activities that are intended to improve reading accuracy, fluency and comprehension. The students are going to work into pairs and they take the roles of a tutor and a tutee. And they will both have the opportunity to read aloud, listen to their partner read and provide feedback, giving them the ability to share in the experience of reading together, which will motivate both high and low achieving students to be able to find their love for reading. And now I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Lindsay. Thank you, Celeste. So our next group of students are culturally diverse students. So, a main thing in the classroom right now in the changing 21st century classroom is that culturally diverse students, which we are going to define um, for the purpose of this study as Black, Hispanic, and Asian students, they are occupying nearly half, and this study was done in 2017, so by now the data may be different, but they are occupying nearly half of the, the seats in a K-12 through public education system, and they're expected to dominate in representation over the next few years, over the next decade. So, we as educators need to be very aware of how to be responsive and how to best suit our classroom to their unique set of needs. But as of now, the educational system is very much tailored to dominant white culture and how to set up the traditional prototypical student to succeed, which is not, it does not fit any longer. 
This may have something to do with the recent reading achievement data that shows that reading proficiency levels for Black and Hispanic students have been on a decline from the 20th percentile for the past two years. So already our students are suffering if they're scoring on average in the 20th percentile and for them to be continuously declining is a huge issue. So we need to look at strategies that can best support them to create uh, more engagement and reading motivation to therefore ensure their success. So the first strategy that um, I wanted to discuss in my section is the SMILE method. So each letter of the word SMILE stands for something. The S stands for sharing, the M stands for me, I for importance, L for liking, and E for engagement. So this method is particularly great because it helps students collaborate with each other and create um, kind of like a community of readers within the classroom so that it's very interdependent. The students are not um, expected to go on this task on their own. They're very much seen as learning from one another and collaborating, finding interests together, finding liking together, sharing their ideas, learning from one another, and therefore producing greater engagement. And this works particularly well with our culturally diverse students, especially when they come in at a lower level because it doesn't expect them to, um, to go on such a daunting task. They're able to, to kind of bounce ideas off one another and learn how to, to create a greater interest from other students in their classroom, which is super, super helpful. The second method is a little bit more of a broad term, um, culturally responsive teaching. So that is, this can be used in a variety of ways for all subjects, um, just for your classroom in general, but we can tailor it specifically focused on literacy. So two um, particular strategies are the multicultural library, which means just having a wide variety of texts, a wide variety of authors, having a lot of cultural representation in your classroom library so that students can really use the books as both mirrors to see themselves and see their own culture reflected, their own values, and also as windows into other cultures and be more informed. And this is very important and has shown to produce great motivation, engagement, and higher achievement for culturally diverse students especially. And just making a point for all of our strategies, you can really use these for all students. These are not just for culturally diverse students mutually exclusively. This can be used for everyone and tailored to their needs in specific. Another form of culturally responsive teaching that we can use is incorporating students' home and native languages into literacy instruction. So the ultimate goal of our reading instruction in the traditional American classroom is for them to be able to read and engage with an English text. But to build that motivation and to build that engagement, it is very helpful to expose them to texts which they find interesting. And that may be, if we have a, a lot of us have Spanish speaking students, bringing in texts that have Spanish references or have Spanish translations to make them feel more comfortable and capable of reading that text. So those are just two strategies that you can use, but I'm sure that in our discussion tomorrow or in two days, we'll be able to talk more about different strategies that we can use to be culturally responsive to our learners. Yes, and now I have the pleasure of sharing with you the next student population that we've researched. This is students with trauma. Another way you can describe students with traumas are students who have adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, uh, coincidentally. And ACEs, they can range from a variety of different experiences, whether it's childhood maltreatment, whether it's physical, verbal, or emotional, to just family stress, like if a parent passed away or there's a death in the family, if a parent is incarcerated, to even just community experiences. If you're in a community that is experiencing these struggles, whether for me in the Twin Cities with George Floyd, having these students who have to live through these experiences, these are factors that go into affecting their reading motivation. And we found out that in 2012, the National Survey of Children's Health found that 48% of children have experienced one ACE or a 22.6% have experienced two or more ACEs. There are students potentially within your classroom who have experienced at least one of these adverse childhood experiences. And the research shows that the child that has more adverse childhood experiences is the lower the academic achievement. And we saw that there's a direct positive correlation between academic and reading achievement and motivation. And the reason that there is this discrepancy for these students who have these traumatic experiences is because it creates a mental block with their processing. As we know with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, feeling safe and secure is one of the most important 
aspects of being able to learn. And so if these students become fixated on this, it makes it very challenging too for them to complete complex tasks like focusing on reading comprehensions. So we wanna make sure that we can provide different strategies for them. And so unlike the previous two sections with low achieving and high achieving students as well as culturally diverse students, the way to best support these students and help them motivate is by addressing the underlying behavior and the underlying trauma. Because we wanna be able to remove these barriers that these students are experiencing in order to help them grow and help them to feel secure and safe in our classroom. And so one of the most common ways you can actually use for these students and which is actually very good and helpful for all students around is helping them cultivate student self-regulation. So this is helping them to be able to practice and control their emotions in a variety of ways, helping them figure out how to breathe and how to best express themselves. Because many times students with these adverse childhood experiences, they do not know how to properly express themselves in an appropriate manner. And so helping them practice mindfulness, thinking, reflecting on their emotions. And one of the common ways that they can do this is through Peace Corners, as you can see. So Peace Corners is the idea that there is a space within your classroom where it is solely for the aspect of helping a student calm down. Whether this is used for someone who can't control themselves, they need a little break, having them go to the Peace Corner allows them to feel safe, secure, and calm down. This is a chance for them to just take a few moments, remove themselves from the situation, and go back to the task at hand. Having them have this short opportunity allows them to become focused and re-attention on the task at hand helping them promote that overall motivation for them to continue on with the tasks that they're reading. Another aspect that we can use to help these students grow is by providing mentor mentor uh, relationships. And so this can come in a variety of ways. One of the common ways is just providing a student, a adult on the staff that they can talk to. Some schools, they do having students meet with the adult two minutes in the beginning of the day, two minutes at the end of the day. Having this experience allows the student to feel like there is someone who cares about them and is there to support them. Having that support gives them a little bit of ease of mind, which will promote their overall motivation. Another possible aspect is the child-teacher relationship training. So this is strictly focused on the relationship between the student and the teacher. And having this will overall promote the connection between the students with these adverse childhood experience, students with trauma and the teacher because the teacher will be able to better understand their student and understand why they're behaving in certain ways to help them address the needs that we do. Overall, these studies are there to help these students grow. And once we're able to address the underlying trauma, then we can implement some of the other strategies that we've talked in this presentation so far to foster that growth and overall raise their reading achievement. So our last group of students is students with ADHD. Now ADHD stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. The hyperactivity refers to the hyperactivity in um, the child's brain. Um, so because of this, a lot of students with ADHD will, uh, they have poor class behavior. Um, unfortunately, there's a strong link between ADHD and academic underachievement. These students especially struggle with reading because one of the main symptoms of ADHD is a low attention span. So um, elementary students don't have the attention span to actually read for an extended period of time. In 2012, the CDC reported that 33% of all students with ADHD who did not have a comprehensive therapeutic educational plan failed out of high school. Um, Unfortunately, for students with ADHD, um, if you don't have another learning disability, then you're not eligible to get accommodations or special services. So this leaves a lot of students with ADHD stuck in the middle. Um, there are some strategies uh, to promote uh, a love of reading for students with ADHD. The first one is peer mediation. So one type of peer mediation is paired peer tutoring. And that is where you can pair two students. So if you have a student with ADHD and a student who loves reading, is a good reader, you can pair them and they can partner read. And this helps the student with ADHD stay on task 
This also helps the student with ADHD to develop the social skills, which a lot of times those students lack. Another strategy to promote reading motivation among students with ADHD is fidgets. So fidgets can be anything from a fidget spinner to a stress ball. Um, I have seen um, people put Velcro under a desk for students. Anything that provides a student with stimulus for the brain, for that hyperactivity in the brain, again, this removes the barrier of, um, of students not being able to focus and provide students the ability to read for a sustained period of time. That way, if you remove the barrier, students will um, hopefully be more motivated to read. Yes, and as we go on, you know, we will get to see you in person on Tuesday for our discussion period. So before then, I want you to think about these two questions as we go ahead, because we talked about a lot of different strategies and diverse populations. And so what we talked about, these strategies, they can already be implemented into your classroom, whether you are in elementary, middle school, or high school. Most of these strategies can be easily implemented across it. So question number one is, what are practical everyday strategies that you can use to implement one or more of these practices in your classroom? Again, we talked about these strategies can be in many different ways. So I want you to think about that. And question number two is what do you anticipate being the greatest challenge or challenges in implementing these practices in the classroom? And so these are questions that we want you to think about now. So that way you can come ready to discuss with us on Tuesday. And so as we go ahead and close out this presentation, I just want to thank you for coming together. Remember, all these ideas that we brought together here, they are able to be incorporated. And some of these students that we talked about, we talked about only four distinct student populations. Some of these students might actually be blended into different groups. So you might have a student who is with ADHD, have trauma, or is culturally diverse. All these students, there are very different. So each student must be addressed individually. But overall, we are there to help them grow. And the best way to help them grow and become lifelong learners is helping foster their motivation. So we hope you learned something from this presentation and we cannot wait to see you on Tuesday. So thank you for your time. Bye, thank you.